Hi there, everybody, and welcome to the Competitive Mindset Training Webinar for Race Day Prep. My name is Cheryl Roos, and I will be taking you through um, this webinar. So I want to give you a little bit of background about myself for one sole reason, um, to just provide some information as to my training and my experience and how it has led me to compile the information that I'm going to give to you today. So my experience is as a business owner for 37 years in the salon industry. And I led many teams and trained many individuals um, to perform their skills. I was also an educator in my industry which led me to being a platform artist. So I knew what it was like to be under pressure very early in my career. In 2015, I took all the information I had as a business owner and as a trainer and as, ed as an educator and thought I would take it to the platform of sport. I had been paddling for the last 17 years of my um, business career, but I wanted to see if all the tools that I had learned were applicable to being an athlete. And so that's what I did. So when I started on this journey, I dove into all the other aspects of training individuals to be at the top of their careers, um, such as in business, but now in the sport, um, in the platform of sport, which led me to take competitive mindset training, um, introduction to sports psychology, because Although I had skills that led me to achieve goals in the past, I had never been a top athlete. My experience is not one where I was an athlete through my whole life. Um, in fact, I never competed as an athlete at all until I was in my 40s. So I didn't have that background of experience that we get sometimes when we're youngsters and you know our parents have us in sports and, and we're playing sports all through our life. I didn't have that. So I had to learn how to be competitive in sport. And then I went on to um, trying out for national teams just because that was the progression of paddling. You know, I went from a team to a club and then a lot of my teammates in my club were trying out for the national team. So that's kind of how I was led to be on the national team in 2015 and 2000 and then again in 19, which never happened because of COVID. Um, however, um, that's the information that I'm gonna share with you today, all the knowledge that I learned. The other thing that I'm gonna give you a little bit of background and information on is um, the law of attraction. I did study that for four years and it was really fascinating to me simply because there's all these mystic tools that I learned about energy attraction. And it wasn't until I got into the platform of sport that I realized after interviewing many athletes for quite some time, um, they kind of knew about this stuff and it wasn't so mystic. It was actually applicable to our lives. And I'm gonna share that with you today as well. So as mentioned, you know, I became a, com once I competed as an athlete myself, I also became a competitive coach with Dragon Boat Canada. Um, my sports psychology and my mindset training and my experience just um, working with all types of people in all kinds of platforms without within my life um, is what I'm going to share with you today. So I have some background experience in working with um, alcoholics and speaking in that realm as well, which was always fascinating to me because I was always intrigued with um, you know, some things about why some people succeed and other people don't. And that was one of the things that I studied was, you know, the people who were downtrodden in their life. And then I also got to study the people who achieved major goals in their life, like top athletes. And I'm going to share all of that with you today as well. So some of the areas that I, I, I wouldn't call myself an expert on, but still drive my passion and, and, you know, keep me learning um, are these areas, which I'm going to share right now, um, competitive mindset training with teams, just how to bring the whole team onto the same page and, you know, get that um, culture within um, a whole team. Because I, I found that, you know, athletes are 
one component, but when you bring this team dynamic, it's a very different component. And it fascinates me as how we can get a group of 20 paddlers on the same page. Um, online fitness, that is something that I created um, during COVID because it was essential for me to get this information out to my athletes that I was coaching at the time. And so I do have online fitness programs, which, you know, are compiled of sport nutrition. Um, I also embarked on some out, um, outrigger training programs because I am a dragon boat coach, but I train solely on an outrigger. And so I have those programs available as well. Of course, I do dragon boat camps, um, race preparedness and motivation workshops, which is a little bit of what I'll share with you today. So those are the areas that I continue to educate myself in. And so I'm always learning and growing, uh, just like we are as athletes. And I think that's the fun about the platform of sport. So my research, these things that keep me awake at night and wondering consistently over time, regardless of what sport I watch or participate in, is I always wondered. And it, this was kind of, you know, the history of the background into the um, law of attraction. I wondered, like, is success, you know, just safe for a special few? Or do we all have the capacity to reach these high levels of success? Um, is it a matter of timing or good luck? Uh, that one really um, made me consider a lot of... Um, a lot of circumstances that would show up in some people's life, but didn't show up in other people's lives. Like they just seem to be in the right place at the right time. So, you know, is that reserved for a few or is it available to all of us? And here's another one. Why do some succeed when others don't? And I have seen less talented people succeed. Um, beyond people who were more talented. And so I'm going to share a little bit of that with you as well. And I also wondered, is there a formula? Like, is there something that these Uber athletes, because I met Uber athletes who were, you know, from, from day one, their parents put them in sport and they just excelled all through their whole life. And so I wondered, is there something that they know that the rest of us don't? I'm going to share that with you in the last um, six or eight slides of this presentation. So stay with me. Now, um, over researching and interviewing many athletes, I can't say thousands, but I'll say hundreds of athletes over um, this last 17 years. There were a few things that sports psychology mentioned um, that I also found myself. And these are the mistakes that I saw where the um, uber talented didn't always succeed, but the less talented may have succeeded. And it all came down to these, you know, a uh, few things that I compiled. So undisciplined mindset. So we're going to talk about the mindset today and just what it looks like when it is discipline. Um, investment attitudes. And these are attitudes where people have predetermined their destiny. And sometimes we're not always aware of it. Now, I also just want to let you know that these were also the mistakes that I had myself because I it wasn't innate for me to be um, a high achiever. I had to learn it. So um, I understand these mistakes. I lived these mistakes and I also found ways to get past them, which I'm going to share with you today. Misunderstood setbacks. Okay. So th this is just how some people perceive um, things that happen in their lives and others perceive it a different way. I'm going to show you what the, those perceptions are and how they can um, be a pattern of self-sabotage. Also, acceptance of circumstances. Some um, high achievers, they don't accept their circumstances in their life quite like the underachievers do. Um, undervalued challenges. Now, I remember, you know, in, um, I think it was grade one, um, when my oldest daughter was in grade one and she had this wonderful teacher and she always said to the, the students, because, you know, we get to go into the classroom at that time. And um, I always heard her say this, and it really resonated with me that she saw every mistake as an opportunity to learn, every challenge that we had as an opportunity to learn. And, you know, that stuck with me when I was going through time trials to make teams. And um, I'll share a bit of that as well. And like I said, investment attitudes, I, 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 I can't 
I can't explain just how much these attitudes make a difference in our life. And once we understand what an athlete's attitude actually looks like, that we can start adopting the attitude that can lead us to success. So here's what we're going to cover. How sports psychologists prepare athletes to compete. Uh, we're going to talk about the mental strength that we need to compete with confidence, how not to choke on race day and the sports psychologist tool. I'm going to give you that tool and I'll go with, go through it with you briefly so you can actually use this tool in your own life and get some good results that maybe help you get that right performance arousal on race day. And the four things that top paddlers do to amp up their training so they can compete with confidence. That's what we're going to cover. So let's dive in. So what is mindset training? Um, so there's a lot of theory about mindset training, and I think it's important to understand that we all use mindset training in different capacities of our life. We're going to be talking about sport today, although the training of the mind is the same whether you're trying to lose weight, heal from cancer, um, recover from divorce, um, any, any big event in your life where you need to start thinking about how you're thinking is mindset training. But basically, it's the development of mind control over our thinking that governs what we do and how we behave in our life. Now, the myth number, the, the number one myth that I want to talk about that, you know, this, this gets my hackles up when I hear this, because some people use um, positive thinking as a, a sort of mindset training that they think will lead to great results. And, you know, I, I think that's really great if you actually believe the positive thinking that you're thinking. So um, it doesn't, for me, positive thinking, like thinking, oh, it'll work just fine. Uh, it's all going to be good. I'm just going to think happy thoughts. Um, that did not lead me to a positive outcome at all because deep down inside, I didn't buy it. I didn't believe it. Anything I was saying to myself on a daily basis, I wasn't buying. And so we're going to talk about how that mindset can actually sabotage our success if we don't believe it because we all have an energy within us and what our mind is saying is sometimes not what resonates you know deep within our heart or our soul and so if it doesn't resonate with us it's not doing you any good so we talk about constructive thinking in, in mindset training and i'm going to go through that with you so mindset training it is not positive and it's not optimistic and it is not built on affirmation. Although we use those three things once we decide on a thought that empowers us and is, you know, a belief system that we feel to be true for us, we can then use an affirmation. But it's really crucial that we believe the thoughts that we're thinking um, to be true and probable for us. I think probable is the big thing. So if I said, oh, I'm going to make Team Canada, um, you know, I'm going to try out and then I'm going to make Team Canada. Like I had to really think about that. I had to think like, is it, is it possible? And if it's possible, is it, is it probable? Like, could I probably do this? And if I can do it, do I want to do it? Right? So aligning these things and setting up affirmations that we actually believe are really crucial when we're trying to create that mindset that we want as an athlete to reach our goal. So what mindset training is in the platform of sport is constructive thinking, thinking long enough to dissect all of those thoughts to find ones that work for us and how it works is with intentional thought. So having that strong intention behind what we think of where we want to go and why we want it, is what we're going to talk about today and the benefit over you know creating this mindset is you know they say that focus for an athlete is one of the um, strongest things that they can develop so if we can focus our thoughts long enough on our intention and believe our intentions um, that is how competitive mindset training actually works so um, I think it was Michael Jordan that said that um, one of the things that he saw in himself 
that separated him from a lot of other athletes was his ability to hold focus. He was just really good at it. And he really said that that was why he outperformed some of his other, um, you know, teammates who were equally as talented as him is he just knew how to hold focus longer. And he really said that that was how he could perform his best. And over interviewing um, athletes for the last 17 years, I can tell you that um, they do have the ability to hold their focus for longer periods of time. And that's what mindset training is all about. So now let's talk about another one of my favorite topics, and that is being competitive in sport. So there's been this myth um, you know, about competitiveness where it's, where it's sometimes perceived as sort of an ugly or aggressive or icky kind of attitude and really competitive, com being competitive as an athlete, um, when you, when you research the top athletes, it's not about beating someone else, although that, that can be a great motivator. It's about them being their personal best. Like they get super competitive with themselves. Like they want to know that they have done their best and whether they win or not, um, they, they know that they've done their best. And so being competitive, you know, sports psychology said it, it's about being your personal best, not the desire to win. Although let's talk about what it's not. So it's not about winning and it's not about beating others. What is it about then? You know, it's about, focused on doing everything within our control to get to the outcome. So although winning is a huge motivator, don't get me wrong. I mean, we all want to win, you know, and that could be why we train as hard as we do. But it's about knowing that the outcome of who we will be at the end of this is what drives top athletes. You know, they know that that training that they do and everything that they do from start to finish um, is within their control, first of all. Um, it's definitely goals that they set up and it's what motivates them to keep training harder. Like they understand that somewhere, somebody out there is training equally as hard as them and they just want to know that on race day they've trained to be the best that they can be so they get competitive with their themselves and they get super competitive about their training so you'll see athletes you know document every aspect of their training they know where they are they they don't second guess where they are on race day they know that they've trained to show up exactly as they are on that day they they know too that they might be five percent maybe three to five percent better than what their last performance was or their last training session or three to five percent less depending on how they can get that performance arousal working for them but they know that they're not all of a sudden going to be incredibly better than what they were training like and they're not going to be incredibly worse and and that's the really good news is they know that they're not going to um, you know, just show up and not be able to perform at all because their training has led them there. Okay, so um, sports psychology, I just want to talk about this for like one second because a lot of, there's this mystery about sports psychology and about mindset training. And I think athletes, we sometimes make it bigger than what it is. And the only thing we need to realize as athletes, you know, we we control a lot that goes on in our outside world, you know, our, our fitness, our eating, our sleeping, and sports psychology is just that area of inner development that we work on as well. And sometimes we don't give it enough credit. You know, we 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 put so much focus on the outer things that we can control because we don't know how to work with the inner world. And I'm hopefully going to give you a few tips on on that today, so you know how to work with your inner world. So let's not make sports psychology bigger than what it is. It's just that area of working with our inner world. So another myth I want to debunk is, you know, winning means that you're a success. Now that's, I, like I said, who doesn't like to win? We, you know, we all want to win, but 
a lot of the athletes that um, I got to chat with and be part of their world, we all understood, you know, that no matter how, whether we won or not, whether we made a team or not, we were confident that, you know, when it came to race day that we performed at our best and we had become our personal best and nobody can take that away from you. And I think that's why, you know, I'm so eager to share this information with us athletes who work so hard. We can't all be number one. In fact, the reason I'm here is I was never number one. I was 11th, 6th, sometimes second, sometimes third, but I was never number one. But that didn't mean that I didn't perform to the best of my ability. And I want to, I want that to really resonate with all of the athletes that are watching this or being part of this training is regardless, you know, how you show up and the extent that you've worked towards, that is your number one. You know, there's just no place in this world for a thousand number ones. Okay, so let's get really clear about what an athlete is right now as well, because the other thing that I lied to myself about was um, my level of athleticism. And so um, we're going to talk about being, you know, the big fish in the small pond and the small fish in the big pond. And an athlete to me and, you know, in, in a lot of realms is anybody who embarks on a sport specific um, training period to get the, the end result. So, um, you know, just because you're athletic doesn't mean you're an athlete in your sport. And just because you train and you're really fit does not always mean you're an athlete in your sport. So I can train to run a marathon, but that doesn't make me a great paddler. So us paddlers today, when we're talking about being an athlete in our sport, it's that person who has that full cycle, whether it's a year or two of training, that from start to finish, they know their end result and they are committed to doing that specific training that's for their sport. So th when I'm talking about an athlete now, that's what we're talking about. So what makes athletes athletes? Now, again, in, in, I was not, I, and, and I was never number one. And I, I would say I was in the realm of the top athletes for certain periods of time, because that's another myth. Like I can't be a top athlete all the time. I, I don't train 24 seven. Um, you know, the reason the Olympics have a four year cycle and the, the reason, you know, athletes train for that four years is it takes a lot of time to become a top athlete. And we don't, you know, I, I'm not being sponsored to try out for these teams. And, um, you know, we're, we're not as adults, we're not always, um, we don't have the funding. So, you know, when my kids were young and they were competing, they had the funding. I was the parent that, you know, got them to practice and paid for all their training. <laughs> We don't have that as athletes. So there's a multitude of reasons why we don't stay in the cycles of training. So um, it's okay to understand that just because you were number one once doesn't mean that you're number one all the time as well. You look at uh, bodybuilders, like they're at their peak for like 10 minutes or an hour out of a whole year versus, you know, all year round. And I think we need to make that differentiation as athletes because especially when we can paddle year round, doesn't mean we're going to be at the top of our gate year or, or our game year round. So what I found um, when athletes were dialed in to achieving their goals is they were a hundred percent obsessed about their process. So um, they trusted their process. They believed they were in the right place and they had all the tools and they had a desire to succeed that was outside of themselves. So here's another myth. Um, a lot of people think that you shouldn't be competing for anything other than for your own personal gain. And that is, that's great if you can muster that up, but not all athletes that I met were competing because they just wanted to be their personal best. Some of them were competing because they had something to prove. And if you look at Michael Jordan, if, if you watch that story, it, it was just the most recent one that I've um, watched. So that's why it's fresh in my mind. But, um, you know, the, a lot of other teams and coaches recognize that if they challenged him or said something like, yeah, he was really off his game, he came back 10 times stronger the next game. So sometimes we have things outside of ourselves that drive us so intently 
that we get obsessed with, you know, just reaching our goal. And that can be a really positive thing. Um, you know, I coached a team once who was breast cancer survivors, and they were so determined to overcome their illness that that was their drive and passion. So it doesn't always mean that it has to just be something that we want. It can be something, you know, outside of ourselves. There was also a team that I coached once where um, three of the ladies on the team had just lost their husbands. And so they were just needing to get out there and find something you know, that motivated them to get up in the morning and dragon boating was one of those things. So it can be outside of ourselves, but it usually means that they get 100% dialed into the process because healing through sport or recovering through sport or proving something through sport means we're really focused on ourselves and that's usually our process. So let's talk about this attitude and the process as we go along. So another thing about competitive athletes. So a competitive athlete, um, we talk, I, I mentioned that, you know, being the small fish in the big pond or the big fish in the small pond. So, you know, a lot of times as a, as a, um, a team member, there were times when I was at the top, you know, and I call that being the big fish in the small pond. So that was easy for me. I wasn't really being challenged um, and, and it didn't take a lot of effort. It was only, you know, when I became the small fish in the big pond is when I really started growing and changing my attitude as an athlete. So, um, you know, competitive athletes, they want to be the small fish in the big pond. So they keep looking for different ways to, um, you know, to reach their goals. And it's, it, there's a danger, you know, there's a danger with, um, you know, remaining the, the big fish in the small pond where you're at the top of your team or you're at the top of your club. And as athletes, it means, you know, we've stopped growing, right? So um, just to give you a little bit of insight for me, what that meant was, um, you know, when I tried out for C the Senior B women's team on Dragon Boat Canada, the national team in 2015, um, I was the 11th left chosen and my coach made no bones about it. It was, it was like, Cheryl, you, you got in, like you just got in, right? So there were 11 left chosen or 12 left paddlers chosen and you were the 11th. So I knew, like I knew I'm going to be around a lot of great big fish. I got a lot of opportunity to learn and I was just so thrilled to have that opportunity because I was the big fish, you know, I was the big fish in my small pond and all of a sudden I'm getting to a place where there's a lot of big fish and I got a lot to learn. So we really embrace that, you know, the characteristics um, of a competitive athlete too. Here's just something that makes up their, their, their character. It's, it's who they are. You know, they want that self actualization. So they want to be faced with themselves right? Um, when you're not being challenged, you will not be faced with yourself too often. When you're constantly being challenged where you, you got a rung and, and you got to keep climbing the ladder to get to the next rung, you're going to meet yourself. You're going to meet yourself right where you are. And that is a characteristic that I found of a lot of competitive athletes. They want to meet themselves like they want to actualize. Another thing, remember when we talked about um, investment attitudes before, they don't form opinions. So they're and I had a lot of opinions about where I belonged, um, what I deserved as an athlete on, um, you know, trying out for national teams, club crews, um, what I thought I was and what I thought about other people and what I thought about situations. And I used to spend so much time judging them. And I realized as an athlete, when you're obsessed about your process and you're just trying to um, go to the next step in that tryout process, um, you don't have, you don't form any opinions. You just let stuff go and you move on to the next um, process. So they don't invest in who they are, but they have a lot of invest investment into who they want to be. So they've given a considerable amount of thought in who they want to be, who how they want to show up, what goals do they want to achieve along the way. So. Those investment attitudes um, the, uh, of, of the, the, the top paddlers in, in 
the big fish in the small pond, sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a sec, um, they can really hold us back. And the characteristics of the top athletes, the competitive athletes that I learned from, they just didn't have that. So in conclusion, competitive mindset training. It just consists of the training of the mind to develop those attitudes and those characteristics and the behaviors of athletes who want to be their personal best. So let's keep it real simple when we talk about competitive mindset training. That's, that's all it is, developing those attitudes, behaviors, and characteristics. Now, why we choke on race day. So it's really interesting because um, my husband is a curler and um, I don't curl. I'm not that good at it. And I, you know, I don't like being cold for, I don't like, I don't like curling. So I, I never tried to get competitive in it. But I watch him and his teammates. And um, because, you know, I, a lot of time coaching athletes, I don't always get insight into the conversations that these athletes have behind the scenes. And one thing that I realized from listening to um, other um, sports and uh, people who are participating in sports, like my husband and his team, is they get to they get to uh, a bond spill and they realize they want to win, you know, and it's all of a sudden, oh my God, we we really want to win, and they know they can't control whether they're going to win or not, and and that's usually why they choke. Is that I'm not going to say they do because you know they don't always. Sometimes they you know pull it out too, but it's that fear. It, it's that fear right away when you get to the festival and it's like oh my God, I really want to win and I'm afraid I'm not gonna. That attitude right there is where us athletes try to control that performance arousal so that when we get to race day, we have a different understanding. And that's what performance arousal is all about and choking on race day. So some of the fear-based thoughts that I've had as a festival paddler when I'm just paddling with my team and you know we're going to festival and then all of a sudden I get you know, to festival and I, I really want to race and win is, you know, I, I fear that I stepped out of my league and, and I don't belong. All of a sudden I'm, I don't know if I belong. Like, and that's the biggest thing is we don't know, right? It's like, oh my God, am I going to win? Am I not? I, am I good? Am I not? Um, and sometimes, so we, we, we put on this air of confidence or the attitude of confidence and confidence isn't an attitude. It's something that we build through training. So if we weren't taking enough careful thought through our training, we, we missed the opportunity to build the confidence in knowing what we can do and what we can't do. And the biggest one is I always felt like a fraud, you know, in those early years, it's like, I, I'm here, I'm racing. Like they, sometimes I was put in stroke and I'm like, should I be in stroke? I don't even think I should be in stroke. So. I was really afraid that people were going to find out that I'm a fraud, you know, and I'm not as good as I said I was or I thought I was. And th those fears are the ones that pop up in our mind um, when we show up on race day. They popped up in my mind after interviewing a lot of other athletes. It, they, they pop up in their mind. Like I said, I know that some of the teams that I've coached over the past, they don't tell me that's what they're thinking because they don't want the coach to know, but I know that's what they're thinking. So as a coach, we can, you know, address these fears with our athletes as well, and that can help them perform better. So let's talk about how sports psychologists actually prepare their athletes to dial in for that long haul. And, you know, when, I, when I'm talking about long haul um, as a paddler, you know, we train for, you know, five, six, seven months out of the year you know, we, well, depending on, you know, what level you're training for, for a two minute race sometimes, right? So it's like you got this seven months of backup for a two minute race. So how do athlete or how do sports psychology, psychologists work with, with that? And here's the other myth is, um, you know, people get so focused on race day that they forget that that seven months or that year cycle is that is your training for race day, you know, come race day, there's nothing you can do, right? Like you're trained, that, that's as good as you're going to get. You're not going to get tons better or tons worse. So we have an opportunity to see what sports psychologists do, you know, to get people dialed in for the long haul. And, you know, Sandra and Taylor has a, a, a 
quote that she says, success is the result of how you experience your process um, in the pursuit of your outcome. And I try to remember that as an athlete. So training is more important than race day because that is your success right there. So a lot of times, you know, we can show up to practice and just think it's a practice. We can show up to the gym and think it's just, you know, showing up to the gym, but that's part of your process and that's where your success is built. So let's talk about outcome versus goals. So sports psychologists, um, you know, it's a, it's a number of exercises that, that were given to me as an athlete, a number of uh, questions, you know, put forth as what, what do you want to be at the end of this? And I'm going to leave you with some of these questions as well. But it, it, there's careful thought as to who we want to be at the end and what we want to experience along the way. And so we set up goals in the interim that um, keep us measurable and on track. So goals are just the benchmarks. But the cool thing, you guys, is those goals are actually skill attainment, right? So um, having them are super important, but they're not the be all and end all. So the outcome versus goals is like I mentioned, the outcome is who we become. So, you know, it's important to recognize that if you're trying out for club crew worlds and you, you, you want that goal, like you want that outcome, you're going to be a club crew world paddler at the end of this. So you have to start thinking about that and then start matching the behaviors and the actions and the goals to become that. So, you know, what characteristics do, does a world athlete have that maybe you don't have? What attitudes do they have that you don't have? These are things that sports psychologists will ask of you so that you can stay focused and motivated for the year long training to be on the water for two minutes or 20 minutes or two hours, depending on what you're training for. Um, and this path, this, this path, this outcome is that path of self-actualization. And as I mentioned, that's what I realized that the Uber athletes had that I didn't have. I just wanted to, you know, get results and make stuff happen without realizing that that path and that process is the most beautiful part. And I think that's why, you know, when, when we see athletes, you know, getting a, a gold medal around their neck, you know, and I just got chills up my spine because I remember when that happened to me, um, is you remember the process. You remember every single thing you sacrificed, everything you gave up, um, the people you left behind, because sometimes, you know, we, we have to leave our teams and go to other teams to, to make our goals a reality. And, and so that's where this emotion comes from is the year long process or the four year long process or whatever it took to get there. And the sacrifices we made that, that actualization, it doesn't leave you. It, it's, it's with you forever. And that's the beauty of all of this. Now, um, this is some, um, feedback that I'm going to share with you that I sort of got from a training that I did and a book that I read by Brendan Burchard, um, where he talks about athletes and success. And um, sometimes, you know, one of the things that happened to me when I was on this process is I had a lot of people in my life who, um, you know, I was always there for them. And when I embarked on this um, goal achievement, I wasn't always there for them. And, you know, it was hard on me. So I'm going to share with you why some of the reasons why goals really matter and why it's okay to set them and to leave some other things behind as we're trying to achieve these big outcomes. It turns out that um, Brendan had studied athletes for much longer than I had. And his book is such a good read. Um, High Performance Habits is what it's called. So I really suggest that book. It really helped me um, as an athlete, but it also really gave good conclusions to all the athletes that I had met and researched as well. And they say that, you know, he says that goals lead to overall happiness and people that had goals just had this ability to, you know, manage challenges in their lives. They had a desire to take on challenges where some people who didn't have a goal, they really didn't care to take on a challenge, you know? Um, and he says, Brendan says, and 
I've seen this happen to a lot of people in my life. It all of a sudden raises the likelihood that they're going to do self-care. Like they're going to eat well, they're going to rest. They're really going to be dialed into taking care of them, of themselves. And that's one of the cool things about, you know, embarking on a, a process to becoming a top athlete is um, you're really practicing those self-care things that are just healthy for us. And they really get a great perception of how they are in comparison to others. Um, and I learned that and they also have a really strong confidence in adversity and those these skills that we learn um, along the path of being a top athlete, we don't lose those skills. And I think that's, you know, one of the reasons why I like the platform of sport so much is um, it was just that platform where I learned these skills that I now use in other areas of my life. And I can attest to some of the other athletes that I trained with and that I've coached they use these skills in other areas of their life as well. So goals are good. Goals are good. They actually will make you happy in the long term. So top athletes realize that regardless of the successes, they recognize this journey um, as an evolution of this person. And these, the, these skills and the, you know, this gives your life purpose and meaning, um, your skills, and your effort and all the training that you do that leads you to your dreams. Um, that's just sole purpose. And so I think it's really important. And I want to acknowledge you for being here and, you know, listening to this webinar as part of that process and know that it gives your life deep meaning that you're, you have these goals and you are on that journey. So getting the mental strength to um, compete with confidence. So I talked about this a little bit early, earlier, and I here's the one thing about mental strength that I'd like you to um, understand that I had to learn is it is a skill, okay? Um, I wasn't mentally strong before. I started on my journey and I learned how, and if I learned how, you can too. And the big thing to realize is um, you are going to race like you train and training is your opportunity to build the mental strength. So competitive competitiveness is built through that that process. Um, like we talked about earlier, you know, athletes get obsessed with their process. That is where competitiveness competitiveness is built. Um, so it's not just an attitude. It's that showing up on race day as a competitive athlete because you did your process, you trusted in your process, you did your process, and you know how you're showing up. So process, process, process. This is the development phase of your mindset training, of your skill development, of your growth as an athlete that takes you towards your goals. So the criteria that you set forth in your process or that your club has set forth or your national team director has set forth, um, they, they've really thought out the process, okay? So as a coach, I can tell you that when a team has a goal, my job as a coach is to put the criteria in place and put the plan in place and put the process in place so that all the athletes have to do is do the process and they will reach their goals. So your job as an athlete is to find the process you believe in that you want to be part of and do it, do it without fail, do it without question and just do it. And as you do it, you will build that mental muscle, the emotional resilience through your training. That is what training is all about. Mindset training is training. Just like we build muscle in the gym, we train muscle in the mind and create those neural pathways through our mind that talk to our body that build our skills as we go through the process. So building mental muscle is no more than showing up in your training without too much questioning. So remember when we talked about, uh, and we're going to, when we get into the four attributes of top athletes at the end of this, we're going to talk about actually the skills that we can do to start, you know, focusing in and creating that mental strength. Now, if you're a solo athlete and you are training to either try out for a national team or you're training your, on your own, like for example, in Dragon Boat, a lot of us train on outriggers and we train alone. 
understand that when you train alone, you still have that opportunity to build the process, right? So how you can prepare, um, you know, even when you show up for Dragon Boat training, you can take every scenario that's happening to you in your day. So let's say you had a lot of um, mental or emotional struggle in your day and you have to train and you have to show up. You can use those scenarios to prepare you uh, for race day in Dragon Boat training or in your Outrigger training or whatever training you're doing that day, even if you're going to the gym. It's like you've got all this stuff going on. Let's use what you have going on. Let's acknowledge it. Instead of just going to train and, and not really being dialed in, let's acknowledge what's going on because on race day, that could happen. So let's use what's happening in our daily life to show up for training and then work with that. And I'm going to give you a tool um, pretty soon that will help you um, to put all those things into different areas of your life that you can actually build the mental strength, okay? Now, um, the reason we do this is once we've done it once, we can then recreate that scenario on race day. But if we don't intentionally do it, meaning we don't acknowledge that that is what we're doing is we've got this really crap weather all of a sudden blowing in when we're, we're doing our endurance training. And now we have to figure out how we're doing our, our endurance and what our heart rate's going to look like and all these variables that come into play. If we don't acknowledge that and we just go through the training with frustration, we don't realize that we're building mental strength and we don't realize that we're preparing for race day. So... That's all we have to do is, is learn to bring all of the scenarios that happen to us in our life to our training. So in conclusion, competitive mindset training really just consists of training the mind again to develop the attitudes and the behaviors and the athletes or er, attitude for athletes to perform at their personal best on race day. Okay. All right. So the process. I like to document and um, I like to do it. I've seen the top athletes and the uber athletes that I talk. Uber athletes to me are people who've been athletes in more than one sport, right? They could they, they do dragon boating and they're a top athlete and they curl and they're a top athlete and they swim and they're a top athlete. And everything they do, they're a top athlete. Um, they document, okay? So they when when they have decided that they are reaching the goal, they, they document, you know, um, all of their observations and their awarenesses, the goals that they've reached, um, the outcomes that they've reached in previous, um, training and embarking on different, um, goals and achievements. They document all of this and it becomes, um, their confidence library, right? So they, when they know that they have these confidences behind them, they also look to them. And we're going to talk about that on how to prepare for race day. So when we can document all of this um, experiences that we have, that we've overcome different scenarios in training, we can use that on race day. So remember that you race like you train. So all of these habits that you build in your training actually become race day habits. So race day, you know, race day is so much um, of, of these uncertainties that can come forth. The more we prepare for them prior to, the more prepared we will be on race day. And I wish I could give you a magic formula that says, here, t drink this and you won't have any anxiety on race day. You're gonna have anxiety, but I'm gonna talk to you in a few minutes about how to change that anxiety into really positive performance around. Okay, so let's talk about not choking on race day and implementing your strategy. So Brendan Burchard also says that the journey to greatness begins the moment our preferences for comfort and certainty are overruled by a greater purpose that requires challenge and contribution. So being the big fish in the small pond is easy and we prefer that that's really comfortable but the minute your greatness happens is when you step out of that so let's talk about choking on race day and why we experience fear bottom line 
is, you know, when I was in the salon industry, they always said you were as good as your last haircut. So that really motivated me to make sure that my last haircut that left the salon was great because that was my reputation. That was, that's everything that preceded me. And that's the same as race day, right? So um, you perform basically as well as your last practice. So the your ability to get dialed in and show up on in your training is how you're going to race. Now, another myth that I come across um, that I'll, I see a lot of athletes skip over is um, they're scared of their own fear, right? And I think it's really unfortunate that we get so scared of our fear that it's negative or we, we you know block negative people out or we're always worried about negative but one of the thing one of the reasons we fear things so much is we really want it and i think when we can just recognize that although we're afraid of it and it, it's negative because it makes us feel bad um there's might be some truth behind it and remember that we're driven by desire by those things that we really want. So the very fact that we're afraid to fail means that we might really want what we're going after. So I just encourage you, you know, to um, look at fear, maybe not as such a negative um, thing that we encounter anymore, but as a curious thing, like get really curious of why you're so motivated to really want it and fear that you're going to lose it. So the solution is to use that fear to redefine our training and to build that performance arousal because performance arousal is connect to our desires and our passions and what we want in life. And we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. So the way we execute and start building this performance arousal is we transfer, we transform that fear and worry on race day into that. Remember that data that we were talking about collecting Okay, so I was really tired, you know, I only had four hours sleep that night, but I showed up to training and I still managed to get my pieces out. You know, when we get afraid on race day and we have that journal that I've seen athletes carry their journals and they have a list of all these things that they've conquered in their training. Um, when we have that to fall back on, we can execute on race day so much better. Um, and we review that list of strategies. So, um, you know, when, when the winds came in and you had to do your endurance and then you had to shift your training, you knew how to shift it, right? So you already have that documentation behind you, you guys. You don't have to worry about it. It's right there for you to see. And that helps you to plan according, accordingly. And um, some of you who've already been on this journey know that we, we as athletes, um, we try to control everything that we can. There's so many things we can't control but we try to control the things that we can. That's our food, um, how we eat, when we eat, our race plan, our race strategy. These are things that we have control over. And the more we focus on those things that we can control, the more we feel in control. So again, the execution on how to not choke on race day is to take those training scenarios, our journals, all the confidence we've built, all the mental strength strategies that we've had, and to use them to our ability. Now, performance arousal. There are a number of strategies that sports psychology, if, 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 when, if and when you ever um, start to work one-on-one -on -one with a sports psychology, you'll build your own performance arousal, but here are some tips that I can give you that helped me and has helped the athletes that I coach as well, just to shift their anxiety into actual um, um, healthy anxiety and that aggressive anxiety. They get to, they start to feel excited about being able to race and coming prepared as a strong competitor, right? Um, they feel pride of already having accomplished a lot of goals along the way because they measured them and they ticked them off on their achievement book and they know that they have already accomplished that. So they have that in their psyche, in their energy. They feel good about it. They feel proud of it. And they also feel super ready to execute all the training and all the skills that they have had that have led them to this moment. So these are kind of the reframes that I use in my own mind. I think back, you know, Cheryl, you've done... 
I don't know, 30 sessions on the water. Like you're ready. You, you, you were in the gym for seven months. This is it. Like, this is it girl. You're, you know, you're ready. And I try to get excited about being able. Here's the other thing I heard. Oh, geez. I think it was some figure skaters say that once that when they're standing in the, in the back waiting for their gold medal performance, um, that's what they say is we get to be here. Like you get to, you have earned your way up here to get to perform even in a time trial you know you have trained for so long you get to be here you're ready you know so not everybody gets to be where you are at this moment and for me that always works great so i hope these strategies work for you as well in performance finding that healthy anxiety of performance arousal so how this benefits you is um a lot of times what works for me is I see that the anxieties that I've had all of a sudden become that healthy life aggression instead of jitters, you know, they get transformed into, I got this and I'm doing this. And these are the anxieties and, and the healthy um, feelings that can really drive us remembering why we're there, who we've become and why we started this journey. Um, that is attached to our personal um, meaning and life purpose. So the sports, uh, the tool that sports psychologists use to focus paddlers on race day is called um, compartmentalization. Now you may have used compartmentalization before in different areas of your life, especially if you've had large challenges without even knowing, or maybe if you have, you just haven't used it in this specific step by step process. So um, for being here today, I am giving you this tool that you can use this compartmentalization tool, um, which will help you as you go through um, your training process. And um, another quote of mine that I'm just going to share with you right now by Brendan Burchard is he always says, to remember that to succeed, you got to remember that the main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. So what that means is the reason you're here, the reason you're performing is because you got here, you're here, you're doing this and, you know, just making it the main focus of your life at that time. Now, I think what's really important to, to realize and by coaching um, particular just breast cancer survivors, you know, they realized one of the attitudes that they have and I really loved and I adopted into my own life because I'm, I'm not a survivor is um, they, they knew that to train was to live and you know that they, they kept so they really kept their training as like one of the biggest things in their life that led them forward. And I think that's what Brendan Burchard is saying here. And, you know, if you can keep that as well in the forward of your mind, I think it really helps you showing up on race day in a really great way. So now we're going to talk about mind programming. Um, compartmentalization is part of mind programming. It's the tool that we use to put race jitters in their right capacity to ignite our performance arousal because we want it ignited. We want to make sure that when we get there, we have the ability of the mindset training to build that in our own mind. So mind programming um, is where we take our conscious and our subconscious mind and we use our constructive thinking we build sort of this picture in our mind and then we bring that into our experience. So this compartmental ex uh, compartmentalization exercise, that's a big long word, hey? Um, I'm gonna leave this with you. I think it's very well laid out. It's self-explanatory. It is a tool that you can use. Um, and I want, I want to challenge you to use it in your training so that on race day, it's easy and it's second nature. It's not something you're all of a sudden grasping for trying to pick out because you recognize their jitters. You know how to use it. You're confident with using it and um, it's second nature to you. All compartmentalization is, is really just a practice of dialing in. Remember the inner mind, the sports psychology of inner mind preparedness is the athlete dialing into the mind and setting up how they want to think 
behave and act over the next period of time. So I will let you read this exercise on your own. I'll let you do this exercise on your own. It's yours to keep. I'd love to hear how this works for you. Um, I know for me, it, it's a simple exercise, but it really helps me get dialed in. Um, another myth I'd like to talk about is again, you know, the myth of winning means you're a success. I want to remind you once again, that your winning is your winning. I have a lot of, I've coached level one, which is novice paddlers many times in my life. And you know, their mandate is to have a lot of fun on the water. And their goal a lot of times is just to make it through a whole 500 meter race because they only get 10 sessions on the water. Sometimes they get five or six, right? So their win to them is, is just showing up the way they plan to show up. So find your win because you're going to be a success. However, you set yourself up to be that success and co that compartmentalization exercise is just your tool to working with that. Okay. So we're going to dial into the last four, um, attributes, but before we do, um, I just want to, refresh our memories about my research and my passion about studying athletes and all these questions that I've had. I'm going to summarize a whole lot of research into four attributes um, of top paddlers and it actually happens to be the scientific formula for success of energy. So I'm going to talk about energy training and how um, these two worlds of the mystic and the science have crossed and how I've learned top athletes do it sometimes automatically without even knowing, but I've put it into these four attributes so that non Uber athletes like myself and maybe like you, if you're not number one and you're the 11th left, um, you can start to use these attributes as well. Okay. So. The four attributes. Um, so this is how they amp up on race day. They build the confidence to compete. They direct their focus. They use their energy to fuel their performance and they get amped up with performance arousal. These are all the things we've talked about over this last hour. And now let's talk about the summarization. So Albert Einstein said that success is 1% talent and 99% hard work. So, so grit does prevail over talent. And I have seen some less talented people more hungry for the outcome than the talented. And sometimes this just happens because the talented don't have to try, you know, it, it's just something that comes easy to them. And so if you don't have to try, you don't value the process quite as much. And so sometimes they just don't try as hard. Um, the four attributes are hard work, discipline, persistence, and aggression. So let's talk about hard work. Now, hard work doesn't mean it's hard. It means that you recognize that there's going to be a lot of work. So in, in the law of attraction and the law of energy, they say that the more work something gets, the stronger it builds. So think about training. The more training you do, the better you get, the stronger you get, the stronger you feel. So an attribute of high achieving athletes realize that it's going to be hard work. Okay. This is how they exert their physical energy There's four capacities of energy, your mental, your physical, your emotional, and your spiritual and hard work is, um, you're exerting physical energy. It's all those actions that we take that lead us towards our goals. And it's putting in that continuous effort that builds the momentum that leads you to success. Brendan Burchard also says this. Now, the other thing to realize is that some people put in a bit of effort here and a bit of effort here and a bit of effort here, and they can work really hard, like they can put out and they can be sweating. But without that continual process of hard work, you're not building that momentum. You're not building that confidence. You're not building it in your body. You're not building it in your mind. Hard work is one of the attributes of national and world athletes. Now, and this is cute. Here's a cute story because I remember laying out the process um, when I was taking a crew to, to 
uh, nationals to, to try for a berth for Club Crew Worlds. And I laid out the process in a document. And one of the paddlers looked at the, the, the document. And she said, well, I don't want to do this. And I'm like, you don't want to go to Club Crew Worlds. So this is really, this is really cool to recognize that she didn't want to do the hard work, right? Like she didn't want to put on the work. She wanted to go there, but she didn't want to put in the work. So she just stepped away and said, no, I don't want to work that hard. The second one is discipline. Now, discipline is, you know, sometimes it's a icky word. And I actually love this word because discipline is, this is the, the attribute that keeps our mental focus aligned with our goals. Okay. So people think that discipline has to be uh, hard and, 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 and non-permeable and, 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 um, stuck and, you know, really just simplified to this, um, hardness. And it's not, it's really just understanding that the discipline happens in our mind to keep us going. Okay. It's, it's that ability to stay in the game for the long haul. And it's that unwavering, um, mindset that we use towards our training, right? Like just doing the process and doing it without question. Here's another thing I just want to share with you is um, sometimes it happened, you know, I experienced this. Oh, I did this a lot. And I've had other paddlers um, question process. Why do I have to do that? Like, why is she making us do that? Why do I have to go there? Why do I have to race? I don't want to take the time off work. Every time you question something and you don't just do what's in front of you do, we, we just don't use our mental effort to do what's the process in front of us to do. This discipline matters because the minute you start questioning is what I call rumination. Well, it is rumination and our mind is going somewhere else. So anytime our focus, remember Michael Jordan, anytime your focus is on why is she making us do this rather than undoing this, you've lost the energy, right? And you've lost the momentum that the athletes that are just doing what's in front of them to do, they're building that momentum. They're staying on the path. They're getting further ahead. So this is where grit does prevail. Sometimes, not always, over talent. So think about your discipline as disciplining your um, mental energy to control where your emotional and physical and, and spiritual energy will go. The only person you are destined to become is the person that you decide to be. And that is part of what you decide as an athlete. Who am I going to be? How am I going to show up? Persistence. Persistence, you guys, is, is resilience, right? Um, but persistence for me was learning to manage my emotional energy. So I used to see, and this is where I see the undisciplined minds of, you know, how, how people see challenge and setback. Really, I used to think that everything happened for a reason and it does maybe, but the reason was for me to, to either realign, reset, rethink, you know, what, what I see this challenge as. I used to think it was like, oh, this challenge happened. It meant I'm not supposed to be trying or, or, you know, and I would get really down about that. And I would spend hours ruminating and thinking about this. And my energy was just being drained. And I think, you know, persistence, I, I think one of the best ways that we can see this resilience happening naturally in our life is we can see what an energy drain feels like emotionally or mentally. If you've ever had an argument with somebody or there's a stressful situation at work or, you know, somewhere in your life and you can just, you can just feel your energy drain. Persistence would mean that you don't attach to that and that you completely just focus your mind back where um, it needs to go. So this is persistence is about developing that emotional strength to fuel your performance, understanding that you get to choose where your thinking goes, um, how you perceive the obstacles and the challenges that show up in your life. You get to perceive how the judgments that you make about what these things will show up, but you get to decide on the person that you want to be that handles them, how they want to be. So rather than thinking that setbacks show up that maybe are supposed to take you off the track, Maybe it's just something you got to go around. And Michael Jordan also says that. I mentioned him a lot this time, but at any rate, um, he's also said that, you know, when you're up against a wall, figure out how to go over it, around it. it, it this persistence is what 
an attribute that top athletes have that I didn't have. And resilience, again, is a mental strength that's built. Aggression. Okay, so if uh, I'm talking to the ladies out there, maybe, maybe the ladies. Aggression is a, is a masculine energy. Now, this doesn't mean that just men have it and women don't. It's a masculine energy. The feminine energy in me um, loves to nurture and loves to build and create community and, and, and all those things. That's the feminine energy, not gender related feminine energy. Aggression is a masculine energy. And for me as a woman, I wasn't brought up to tap into that aggression. But I've learned that that masculine energy or the energy of aggression is that desire to get out there and attain. Okay, so sometimes it comes naturally to some people, persons, and sometimes it doesn't. So for me, um, I had to really understand that my aggression was attached to my spiritual energy, my soul desires, my passion. Okay, so the reason that, and it's also attached to innately what makes us good at what we do. So I don't curl. I'm not a good curler because I'm not really that interested in it. However, I, there's something about paddling. I just love that whole physics of paddling and trying to figure out the stroke and it's my passion. So we all have different passions. We all have different desires. The desire to achieve something might be because my husband left me. It might be because I'm recovering from cancer. It might be because I'm recovering from addiction. It might be because I want to prove to my my boss that I can, to my last coach that I can. I, I don't know where you're coming from, but your desire is yours to find out. And that aggression is very healthy when it can ignite our performance arousal. So I talk to athletes a lot, especially female athletes, about finding and tapping into that aggression. The reason you care so much about something is because it's personal to you. And the more you can find out what that is, the more you can fuel your training and your performance. So if we want to get that positive performance arousal, that competitiveness that isn't against a mean aggression towards someone else, but a healthy aggression within us to succeed, the better we're going to perform. And we can pull that out of our hands. So these are, in summary, these four attributes is really about all you need to know in this hour and a bit um, webinar. Um, I'm going to leave you with a final quote. And this is um, just, you know, Ralph Waldo Emerson said this, without ambition, one starts nothing. Without work, one finishes nothing. The prize will not be sent to you. It's not going to come to you in the mail. You have to win it. You have to earn it. You have to work it. So I'm going to leave you with that quote. I hope that this makes sense. I know I kind of skipped over the compartmentalization exercise. I really believe that's something you need to do on your own. So I'm going to leave that tool with you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your time. If you need any more help getting um, the competitive mindset um, training a little more ingrained for you, of course, I have some tools and um, training on my website, CherylRoosConsulting.ca. Check it out. Thanks so much for being here, paddlers. And I look so forward to hearing of your success. Bye for now.